They spray our skies Interact with these with the magnetic toxic chemicals. Hi, I'm Rich Lund. This is Debunk Funk. Let's get into it. Why do the seasons change? This is a question with a very well understood answer that you're likely familiar with. As the Earth rotates while orbiting the Sun, at any given time, half of the Earth is going to be facing the sunlight, while the other half is facing the darkness of space. Hence, night and day. But the axis of the Earth's rotation is at an angle, approximately 23.5 degrees. This angle is the direct cause of our seasonal changes. As the Earth orbits the Sun, for half of the year, half of that trip, the axis of rotation is going to be more pointed towards the Sun in the Northern Hemisphere and pointing away from the Sun in the Southern Hemisphere. This is the half of the year from the first day of spring until the end of summer that the Northern Hemisphere receives more daylight hours than nighttime. It is the most extreme on the summer solstice, the first day of summer, the day when you receive the most sunlight hours. And also because during this period of time, the Northern Hemisphere is receiving more sunlight, energy, this is why during those seasons, the temperatures tend to be warmer. The opposite is true for the Northern Hemisphere's winter and fall seasons. It is during this half of the year that along the Earth's orbital path, the axis of rotation is pointed away from the Sun. And if you followed all of that, then you also immediately understand that everything I just said about the Northern Hemisphere, well, during those same times of the year, the exact opposite would be happening for the Southern Hemisphere. So on the first day of winter here in Michigan, well, that's going to be Sydney, Australia's first day of summer. With all of that in mind, how does the flat Earth idea try to handle the seasons? How do they try to explain them? In the flat Earth model, there's a spotlight sun, and it's relatively close to the Earth, it moves around above us in a circular motion, and if the light from it is hitting you, then that's day, and if the light doesn't reach you, then that's night. Already, when first examining this idea, plenty of questions naturally arise. What is the sun? What material is it? What's responsible for its energy output? Why does it float above us and not fall down to the earth? What's causing its circular motion? Finding no real consensus to any of the answers to those questions from the Flat Earth perspective, I can only assume they're still working on it. For now, let's just give them that's how their sun works. In order to use that sun to explain their seasons, they claim that the circular diameter of the sun's path above our heads, well, the diameter changes, and that's the cause of the different seasons. On the first day of Northern Hemisphere's summer, according to their model, this would be the day when the diameter of the sun's path is the smallest, and the territory north of the equator receives the most amount of energy from the sun. This would be the northern hemisphere's first day of summer, summer solstice. From that day forward, the diameter of the circular path increases. The circular path is spiraling out a little bit each day, and the northern hemisphere is receiving less and less and less sunlight from that day forward. This continues until the flat Earth Sun's circular path reaches a maximum of a diameter. And this would be the day when the Northern Hemisphere receives the minimum amount of sunlight, the first day of winter. And from that day forward, the flat Earth Sun then begins to spiral inward again, and the cycle continues. In short, the Flat Earth Model's explanation for the seasons would say that the longer daylight hours and warmer temperatures of the spring and summer seasons for the Northern Hemisphere are because the Sun's circular path is a tighter circle above our heads. And the colder and shorter days of fall and winter, that's when the Sun's circular path is further away from us. Alright, are you up to speed? So we've done a quick crash course on the two different models and how they explain the seasons. Pin both of those ideas for a second. What makes a model a good one? A successful one? In the science classes that I teach, I bring up three major criteria that makes a model or theory a good one. Number one, the model must fit the evidence. Second, the model is as simple as it can be. Nothing is extra that doesn't need to be there. And third, the model can make accurate predictions. In fitting the evidence, this would mean that the model, in its attempt to explain some phenomenon, is never in conflict with something that is readily observed. Already, the Flat Earth Model's explanation for the seasons has a fatal problem here. 
In trying to explain the seasonal changes due to the Sun's circular path having a different diameter, I can at least see how the Northern Hemisphere's longer daylight hours and warmer temperatures could sort of be explained. But when it comes to the Southern Hemisphere, the Flat Earth Model's explanation for the seasons falls apart immediately. If the Flat Earth Model were correct, and Australia's summer is due to the Sun's circular path's diameter being larger, that does nothing to explain why Australia's first day of summer would have as much sunlight as it does. If we look at a Flat Earth azimuthal map, here's an image that shows where sunlight would be hitting on the Northern Hemisphere's first day of summer at some time during the day. Nothing looks terribly in conflict with their idea. But in the Southern Hemisphere, on their first day of summer, here's what the Flat Earth Sun would have to be doing according to their azimuthal map and somehow the spotlight is able to reach its light in all the places that are yellow, yet all the places that are not cannot see the sun. Do you see any issue with that? How can those who are here and here and here be able to see the sun, but those who are closer to it, here, here, and here, not be able to see the sun? Compounding this further, no matter the season, a day is still 24 hours. So if the Flat Earth Sun's circular path has the largest diameter around December 21st, it must travel that circular path faster than six months later when the path is the shortest. And in the Southern Hemisphere, somewhere like Australia, this would be blatantly noticeable. The apparent speed, though, of the Sun across the sky is the same, no matter where it's observed over the globe. 0 0.25 degrees per minute, or if you prefer, 15 degrees per hour. From the get-go, already the Flat Earth model is in conflict in multiple ways with things that can be readily observed. But let's now shift and look at the third criteria of a good model, the ability to make accurate predictions. If a model, any model, can do the first two criteria, fit the evidence and it's as simple as it needs to be, it still doesn't really amount to much if it can't fit the third criteria. How strong a model or theory is is really judged by how powerful it is at making accurate predictions. It's why we try to come up with models and theories in the first place. There's power in being able to predict. Whether Flat Earth likes it or not, their model for explaining the seasons, it makes a prediction, and one that we can test out in our own backyards. Here's what it predicts. If the Flat Earth model's explanation for the seasons is correct, then from the perspective of here in Michigan, on summer solstice, at solar noon, that is when the Flat Earth sun is going to be the closest it's going to be to this observer compared to any other time during the year. And then on the first day of winter at solar noon, that sun should be significantly further away. Visually, we should be able to observe an apparent size difference of the sun. That is what the Flat Earth Model predicts. Now, according to the Globe Model, the sun is much larger than the Earth. It's 93 million miles away. And on the first day of winter or summer or really any day of the year, anywhere on the globe, if you can measure the sun's visual apparent size, it will be no different on any other day. While there would be extremely slight differences, visually none significant enough to notice. Now obviously if somebody wanted to test this out, this experiment would take a minimum of six months. But if you're patient and curious, it can be done. In Debunk the Funk number two, I made a tool that anybody could duplicate for a pretty low cost. Check out that episode for full details on how to duplicate this, but the general idea is that it's an affordable solar filter which you need in order to see something's edge. The screen is there so if we have a grid we can use to measure with, and the whiteout dot in the center just ensures that we're always using the same part of that grid. So, on Friday, June 21st, 2019, Michigan's first day of summer, and then more recently on Saturday, December 21st, Michigan's first day of winter, I used this tool to test out our experiment. And just as a note, you'll see, as before in Debunk the Funk number two, I set the camera to the same focal length, to the same focus. Here we go. All right. It is June 21st, 2019, the first day of summer, summer solstice. According to the Flat Earth Idea, today, at solar noon, the sun should be as close to me as possible. Solar noon occurs at 1.40 p.m., so that's when we're going to conduct our experiment. Or thereabouts, depends on if a cloud's in the way or not. We're going to take a measurement as to the visual diameter of the sun. Okay, just as before, in Debunk the Funk number two, I'm going to turn the camera so that way it is all the way 
focused, zoomed out, same focal length then as in Debunk the Funk number two. I'm going to turn the camera on now. And then I'm going to point it at the sun. Find the sun here. Oh, there it is. Just a little bit there. Get it on the right hand side of the screen. Okay. Now we take the measurement. It's tough to see with all the sunlight if I'm getting this. Oh, there it is. Now I gotta find my white out dot. There it is. Get it in the center as best I can. There we go. Measurement has been taken. Now the next time you'll see me, will be on the first day of winter. I gotta wait six months, you just have to wait a couple of seconds. See you then. And here we are, first day of winter. And I gotta admit, like, in Michigan, this does not happen too often. We've got a totally cloudless sky. December 21st, 2019. And there's our sun. We're getting close to uh, solar noon. Almost time to do it. Solar noon today is 12.35 p.m. in my location. We're at about 12.34 right now. So I'm going to turn the camera on, just as before, going to the full focal length. So we are fully in the same position as we were first day of summer. And for debunk the funk number two, find the sun, oh, hit record. Towards the sun. Get it on the right hand side of the screen. And now, with our instrument, let's take the measurement. Where exactly that was at. Just focus in more again. Alright, there I'm seeing the sun on my screen. So now, okay, solar noon on the first day of winter, December 21st, 2019, we have our measurement. All right, let's analyze the data. And just so we're clear, this was happening now that we're done, 1236, so yep. We hit that right at solar noon. All right, let's look at the results. On the left, here's the sun at solar noon on the first day of summer here in Michigan, summer solstice. And on the right, from the same location in Michigan, here's the sun at solar noon on the first day of winter, winter solstice. The visual diameter of the sun is unchanged. If the flat earth model was correct, then it predicts that the Visual difference of these two images should be significantly different. The sun is definitely much closer in one than the other according to their model. Yet, there is no visual difference in size. Now, while we're at it, because we use the same camera with the same focal length and the same measuring tool as we did in Debunk the Funk number two, we can compare those images to these new ones. These are all in Michigan as well. On the far left, this is the sun right after sunrise. In the middle, that's at solar noon, and on the right, that is the sun right before sunset. The apparent visual size of the sun is no different. The important question to ask now is, of the two models, which model predicts these results, and which model is in conflict with them? I'm Rich Lund. Thanks for hearing me out. And remember, the world needs critical thinkers. Make sure you're one of them. Catch you next time.